Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the classic Call of Cthulhu scenario, The Secret of Castro Negro. Written by Mark Pettigrew and Sandy Peterson, it was first published in 1983's Cthulhu Companion. Coming in at 14 pages, keepers should expect this scenario to take two or more sessions to complete. And instead of taking place in New England, where most of the original Call of Cthulhu scenarios were set, Secret of Castanegro sends the investigators off to New Mexico. It offers us some investigation as well as some seriously deadly challenges. This is among the most lethal of the Call of Cthulhu scenarios that I've run, so while this isn't required, I really wouldn't recommend this scenario for anybody but experienced investigators. There are a few issues with this adventure that I feel need to be addressed before the scenario can be run smoothly, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to offer my tips and my suggestions as a game master who has run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm going to be giving this one to you from a player's side of things as we visit the least inviting town ever. And I'm saying this as a dude that's been to Blackwater Creek, Innsmouth, and some of the sketchier parts of Florida. But before we can go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. Sweet, juicy spoilers. So any players out there, if you ever want to experience this adventure, please stop here. But send your Game Master this way on tips and tricks for running it for you. Okay, Game Masters, let's get this thing started. The scenario begins as one of the investigators discovers a couple newspaper articles in the local paper. One about mysterious cattle mutilations and another about three missing people, all taking place in New Mexico. Man, there is a lot of weird stuff going on in New Mexico these days. Hopefully somebody's going to do something about that. The scenario assumes that this is just enough right there for the investigators to just uproot and travel across the country or wherever and just check this out and get to the root of the problem. But I suggest that to prompt the investigators into the investigation, have them hired by one of the missing people's families. For my game, I had the family of David Lane hire the PCs because they were old school chums. Holy crap, guys. David Lane, our old buddy from back at Miskatonic, he and several other people down in New Mexico have gone missing. And get this. I also heard that there's a bunch of cattle mutilations going on down there, and I bet it's chupacabras. We got to get to the bottom of this. We have to find out what happened. Hold on, David. We're coming to save you. After they arrive in New Mexico, the players have the three missing people to check out, as well as these cattle butcherings. However, the butcherings really don't add anything to the scenario. They're never really explained as to why there's been such a recent surge of them over the past few years, or exactly why they're happening, or anything like that. So I think it detracts from the adventure more than actually pushes it along, so I just cut that part out entirely. Now the big thing to convey to the player characters while they're doing the investigation in Silver City is to mention the distinct boot prints that are found outside one of the windows, and the green eyes of the men that were seen at two of the scenes, and of course mention the tiny town of Castronegro, which is linked to all three men. I also up the role of Adam Little, you know, having him have known David Lane as well as Dr. Godfrey. I also made Adam an NPC that was willing to join the player characters on the rest of their investigation, and I'll get to why I wanted them to have an NPC companion once we get further along into it, but the big thing was that I made Adam Little more of an active character rather than somebody that they, they only meet for a couple minutes and then is never heard from again. I went ahead and made him sort of a companion NPC. Eventually enough clues are going to push the player characters along to the small town of Castronegro, a sleepy little village of 600 people founded by a Spanish Don. We get a little map of the place, as well as maps of some of its locations. To help you understand how Castro Negro should feel, take Innsmouth from Lovecraft's story The Shadow Over Innsmouth, and replace all the water and fish with scorpions and scrub brush. I mean, we got inbred mutants, evil cults, and unspeakable horrors. But they also got a working bar there because Castro Negro don't give a damn about prohibition, so it ain't all bad. With this adventure, game masters are going to need to remember specific details about some of the NPC locals and make sure they sprinkle that into their descriptions of them. Uh, certain things like long arms or vivid green eyes and the like. Uh, this is very important to do, so make whatever cheat sheets that you need to. That way, when the player characters uh, meet these NPCs, you've got a little note right there to mention that, oh, they've got long arms, or oh, they've got vividly green eyes. That way you can go ahead and put that in there and it's not something that you forget and now they never got the clue. Following the clues, the investigators have several interesting locations to check out. One of the most notable is the occult shop, which is huge, especially for such a small town. And the shop owner here is creepy as hell. 
to run him, just picture him a lot like that creepy dude from Phantasm. The tall man? Yeah, run him like that. Among the artifacts in the shop that the player characters can find are six small stone figures, each of those about six inches high. Now these figures are going to pop up quite a bit throughout the scenario. They're going to discover figures like this in lots of different places. So when the players asked me what they looked like, I sort of gave them an unofficial description of what it looks like that each figure represented. And they were the Emperor, the Empress, the Sorcerer, the Warrior, the Beggar, and the Maiden. I just thought there were some cool descriptions to give them, but what ended up happening is that my players put a lot of stock into the meaning of each of these, and whenever they came across more of these figures, they would drill me on which specific statues they were, and then they would come up with all sorts of rabbit hole theories about what this could possibly mean, that this statue was here while another one was there. It was amazing. Okay guys, the tobacco shop has got five statues, and the only one they're missing is the Bega, and because the tobacco shop's Ona's nephew is the one that's missing, I can only assume that the Joaquin represents the beggar. And we found one of those underneath the obelisk. I can only assume that David Lane represents the warrior and Dr. Godfrey represents the sorcerer. There is definitely a very important meaning behind these statues. So Keepers, my suggestion is to absolutely run with this theory, but also expand on it. Uh, there are a lot of statues to be found throughout Castro Negro, so maybe instead of just six types, you know, give them a dozen different types. That way they get real excited when they find that seventh or eighth one, and they haven't seen one like this before. Also, have all of the statues be unique. Even if you've got two emperors, let's say, you know, put them in a, a different pose or something similar about their dress, but not identical. Uh, that way, each of these figures is very different from the others, but the player characters can kind of formulate that uh, these kind of represent the same thing, while these represent the same things as each other. When the PCs visit the bar, they're going to meet the town drunk, which is pretty much like Zadok Allen from The Shadow Over Ends in the short story, and he's going to tell them some story, and he's going to Tell, share too much with them and uh, about the history of the town and the cult that he used to be involved with and that sort of thing like that. So I suggest that after they meet the town drunk and he imparts all the information that he needs to impart to the player characters, uh, have it where one of the local villains has overheard him spilling all of Castro Negro's secrets, and then after the investigators leave, the town drunk is never seen from again. Uh, don't necessarily have him die in some sort of grotesque way, just kind of have him kind of quietly vanish, and all the locals all like, well, I haven't seen him. Now as the investigators snoop, they're going to draw the attention from the bad guys in several different things are going to start happening to them. Now the first one of these is they're going to draw the attention of the local sheriff, who's not a bad guy at all, he's really just sort of an overly suspicious jerk, but he's going to start harassing them because he doesn't like these strangers in Castro Negro. Next is that once per day a random shot is going to come down from the hills um, and down into the city and it's going to be fired at one of the investigators. Now the chance of actually hitting an investigator with this rifle shot is pretty slim and I would give it a zero chance of it actually impaling an investigator. Also, I never let this bullet be something that could just kill a player character just arbitrarily. That kind of sounds like a dick move. You know, they, they walk out of a shop and it's like, whoops, you got sniped by a guy in the hills. Sorry. So I would go ahead and have this be something Thing that's just a near miss. You know, the bullet goes off and you know hits the wall next to their ear. Maybe they get a slight graze for you know one or two or three points of damage. But I wouldn't make this be something that could actually kill a PC, but let them know that somebody out there is trying to kill them. Next, they're going to be sent nightmares at night by the actual villain, Bernardo Diaz. And they're also going to hear different scratchings at their windows and doors at night while they're in the hotel there, but they're never ever going to see what's actually causing all these strange noises at night. This should be extra creepy because while the module doesn't make any big deal about this part, all of the investigators' rooms are up on the second floor, which means all of the scritching at the window glass and the glimpse of a pale face becomes extra freaky weird. The module also has it where one of the player characters gets kidnapped in the middle of the night, and there is no role for this, it's an automatic success from the bad guys, and this is intended to give some sort of urgency to the game, especially because the police are not going to believe that the investigator was kidnapped, the police are just going to believe that this person uh, left the town on their own, and now the rest of the PCs have to, you know, search for their missing friend and hope that their friend is okay. However, I don't like the idea of just taking out a PC as a plot point to heighten the mood for the rest of the other players in there. It's a, 
It's kind of a dick move just to kidnap a PC like that. Now that player is just kind of sitting there watching everybody else play, and that's not much fun for them. And I want my players, if they're going to come to my house and play, I want them to have a good time. So my suggestion is that instead of kidnapping a player character, have the bad guys kidnap a friendly NPC. And uh, this is the reason that I uh, brought in Adam Little as an in, uh, investigative NPC that could come along and join them. That way you could kidnap this friendly NPC uh, who is a member of the party, and then the rest of the group gets to you know, have the mood heightened and the tension as they're searching around trying to find their friend and hoping their friend is okay, but all of your players are still engaged in playing the game. Now one location is the obelisk, and I think the clues to let lead the investigators to the obelisk are kind of thin, so I recommend that if the investigators are searching, you know, where the rifle shots are coming from, that a search of the hills could lead them to the obelisk, and that way they can uh, get all the different clues that they can find there. Another location it can be found, either from the obelisk or talking to the town drunk, is the Old Bond. No, up until this point, the investigation's probably been pretty tame. All investigation with no real combat or horror to speak of. But here... It is about a change. Inside the barn, they're going to discover some rolls, as well as a couple more of those statue miniatures that keep popping up, and a pair of enchanted sickles. And if they follow the faint music that they keep hearing, a trapdoor is going to lead them to a secret room underneath the barn that has a servitor of the outer gods inside of it. Now this thing is bad news, and probably the only weapons that they're going to have that could even harm this thing are those two magic sickles that they just found, which to use the sickles you have to use the axe skill, which starts off at 15%, and your player characters probably don't have axe. Now thankfully it spends the first couple rounds casting a spell, which gave us time to get a few good hits in before it struck, but after that... It had nearly wiped us out. Once the monster is dead, the player characters are going to find the remains of the three missing people. And if you did kidnap an NPC, you know, you can either find them alive or dead in there, just depending on how long it took the PCs to find the place underneath the barn. Uh, you might also throw in the body of the town drunk if you want in here. Like, maybe they threw him in here and the servitor killed him, or maybe they killed him and threw him in there, figuring the servitor might like a snack. So you can kind of use this as the town's body disposal site. Now, it was at this point when I ran the adventure that the investigators decided to call the police. Now, the monster dissolves after a couple rounds, so there's no monster body to show off, and the cultists are going to burn the barn down, and with dynamite they're going to cave in the little cave that's underneath it, and it's going to destroy all the evidence. The end result of this is that the investigators got arrested for destroying the barn and kind of causing a panic when there was nothing wrong. And one of the player characters got away after a merry chase, and then we had a jailbreak, a mishap with a stolen car, and the kind of sort of accidental killing of a police officer, and a whole world of new problems happened for them. Look, now that one wasn't our fault. You were running with a couple new players for that session, and every Call of Cthulhu player needs to learn the hard way that will sometimes call on the cops as a good Good idea, you should always be ready for that to blow up in your face, because it regularly does. Also, technically most of us were insane by that point, so we really can't be held accountable for what happened. Eventually the clues are going to lead the investigators up on top of the hill where Bernardo Diaz's mansion is located. We fight some mutant dogs, and we have to figure out how to break into this place, and then we get to explore around this decrepit home. We also find an arsenal of mythos tomes in here. Twenty mythos tomes are here. And while each of them only gives a Cthulhu mythos rating of just 1%, and that's not that much, each of these books has one to three spells inside of it, and that seems a bit extreme to me. Now, the module goes on to say that none of these books are in English. They're in uh, Spanish and Latin, Greek, a couple Asian languages, as well as some obscure occult tongues and the like. So game masters can uh, make these any languages they want, just as long as they aren't English, and it's extremely unlikely that any of the investigators would be able to read all of these books if you give it a really, really wide stretch of different languages that they could be written in. But keepers should go ahead before the adventure and prepare what languages the books are in. Uh, that way, when they, they ask you, you've already kind of got a pre-written list of uh, uh, what languages they are, and also determine if they have to make certain roles to even figure out what languages some of these are in, and then they have to figure out if anybody 
actually knows the language or might be willing to go out and learn the language in order to read these specific tome or not. So uh, you can make it to where the books are something that could stick around for a long time throughout the rest of the campaign, but the investigators have only really read about three or four of them while they've got 20 to choose from, and eventually they hope one day somebody will be able to read all of them. Now one other thing that I added here was a diary, or really a huge collection of diaries. Uh, Bernardo Diaz is 300 years old, so he's got enough diaries to fill a U-Haul. But the reason that I went ahead and put his diary in the library is that way if the investigators take the time to read his diaries, uh, they can learn the secret of Castanegro, they can learn about the ring, they can learn about the degenerates, they can learn about the cult, and everything else that's been going on in this town. Because otherwise, there's not really a way the investigators can learn all the great information that the Keeper already is aware of. I've brought this sort of thing up in different scenario reviews that I've done before, where uh, modules might give the Game Master a ton of great backstory and different information as to what put these different pieces into play before the adventure begins and what all's going on, but then it offers no way for the PCs to learn this information and therefore the players learn that information as well. So I think putting the diaries in here is a really good way for the uh, PCs and therefore the players uh, learn all the information about the Diaz family, the cult, uh, Diaz's immortality, the degenerates that are living underneath the house, and all sorts of information like that. So if they snag the books, and if they read them, which they probably are not going to have time to uh, read them that much during the course of the adventure itself, but after it's done they can sit down and, you know, properly learn what the secret of Castro Negro is, there is a way that they could do that, and it's probably also going to cost them a little bit of sanity just to do it. Eventually in the basement, the player characters are going to meet the villain, Bernardo Diaz. He's going to be inside of his lab with this sort of rat-like familiar that's named Greedy Gut, and this is going to be an extremely hard combat, harder still because Bernardo Diaz can't die. A magic ring that he's wearing keeps him alive and regenerating, making him completely immune to physical damage. Well, not immune exactly. I mean, if you do 17 points of damage in a single round, that's going to drop him. But then the next round, he's going to get right back up again as all those bullet holes start closing up for maximum scary effect. Eventually, the PCs should figure out that Bernardo's ring is the source of his power, because it glows red whenever he's regenerating. And if they cut off Bernardo's hand, it severs the tie to him, and Bernardo instantly falls down dead, his body withering into a dried husk. Once Bernardo is dead, the scenario is essentially over. Uh, there are a few other details that might still be left hanging, some of the cultists that are in town, or uh, the police that they have to deal with. There's also 300 or so degenerate mutants that are living in the labyrinth underneath the house, so the, the PCs might want to do something about that. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about them, because once we burn this house down, the signature move of Call of Cthulhu Investigators, I am sure that that is going to solve that problem. There is no way that any of them might escape and terrorize New Mexico like those mutants in the hills have eyes. My biggest issue with this scenario is the ending. Bernardo Diaz, he's just hanging out in his lab underneath the house, you know, kind of waiting for the investigators to come walking in, kind of like he's the uh, video game boss on the final level. So I suggest that keepers have Bernardo move around, especially if the PCs are making a lot of noise upstairs, you know, have him go upstairs and investigate what's going on. On. Or if the PCs, you know, hide upstairs and they wait for him, he might just eventually, you know, come out of the lab and use the bathroom or something like that. Also, there's an upstairs window that Bernardo can use to look down upon the city. And uh, I also added to where at the chapel there were lights that were glowing in the chapel at night and then lights that were glowing up in the mansion at night. And that was a good way to kind of give the PCs the hint to go up into the top of the uh, steeple of the chapel and that's where they could find the statue and they could find one of the hints that might lead them to the pillar. But the point is, go ahead and have Bernardo move around. Don't just have him sitting in the final room kind of like a video game bad guy. Now, one final thing that can happen in this scenario, and it can have some long-lasting effects on the rest of the campaign. After Bernardo Diaz dies, his magical ring remains, and if a player character puts it on, they fall into a coma. After a few weeks, they're going to wake up, most likely in a hospital, and they're going to learn that this ring is now permanently fused to their finger. There is no way to get this ring off without actually cutting their finger off, uh, which also means that the other PCs have a high chance of actually cutting off the unconscious person's uh, finger while they're trying to revive them. So so it's possible they're going to wake up earlier than that to uh, one of the other PCs, you know, sawing their finger off, and that's going to revive them from a coma. 
But providing that the other player characters don't, uh, and the PC wakes up and they've still got all ten fingers and the ring on one of them, they're going to find out that they've got a little visitor for them. Holy crap, how long was I out? I had the weirdest dream and... Hi, Jack. I'm your new special friend, Paddock. And since you no longer age as you wear my ring, we're going to be friends a long time. Paddock is this gross little familiar creature who's going to uh, help out this now immortal investigator. And he's really handy. He's got a lot of great information and can do a lot of useful stuff for them. But he's also going to start slowly begin warping the investigators and into an agent for the great old ones. Now, keepers, you're going to need to play this creature very, very carefully. Make him very nice, very friendly, very helpful, even though he's kind of gross and weird. Uh, he's got an eternity to corrupt this PC, so he shouldn't, you know, jump right into it right away. He might spend quite a while being very friendly, very helpful, kind of earning the investigator's trust, because they're not going to trust him at first, because he's a creepy little monster. And then eventually, as maybe when the investigator is going through a bout of madness or some sort of period where they've uh, got a little bit of their sanity weakened, that's when Potek is going to slowly start making his moves, start corrupting him and turning him into an agent for the uh, evil old ones. Overall, I really do like Secret of Castor Negro. It's a slow burn scenario where the first half of it is the PCs investigate Silver City and eventually investigate the town of Castor Negro itself. Keepers just need to make sure that they focus on the mood for the adventure and they slip in all the different tiny details like eye color and the like without it being too obvious when you're giving them up. You know, don't kind of make a big deal about it. Just kind of casually throw that in when you're describing the different NPCs that they make. Me. It has a very Shadow Over Innsmouth feel, and I've said before that Shadow Over Innsmouth is my very favorite of Lovecraft stories, so that's part of the reason this scenario really does appeal to me. Also, don't forget the dreams in the hotel at night, and uh, play the sheriff to where he's not actually a bad guy, he's just a jerk that keeps getting in the PC's way. And depending on how the scenario plays out, how they treat him, what the sheriff might see, by the end of the adventure he might end up being an ally of theirs, so make sure you don't make him too villainous, but also make sure that when they first meet him he is a total jerk and they absolutely hate him. But the combat, once combat happens in this scenario, it is brutal. Uh, the servitor beneath the barn and the Bernardo Diaz himself are both extremely deadly. My two biggest problems with this scenario are pretty easy to fix. The uh, cattle mutilations, which it, it never explains why we're having cattle mutilations all of a sudden and why it's ramped up. I mean, these uh, degenerates have been living here for centuries, so surely they've eaten before now. Why is it suddenly spiked? I think that distracts more than adds to the scenario, so I suggest just chopping that out altogether. And the other thing that I have the biggest problem with is the uh, PC getting kidnapped, uh, which I think that's just a dick move to take a PC out like that. So if you change that to where it's an NPC or just cut that part out altogether, uh, I think it solves the problem. I really do like the idea of using an NPC. That way you could have kind of the, uh, the nice tension come up as somebody gets uh, kidnapped. But if you don't have an NPC, just go ahead and cut that part out altogether. There's no need to just punish one of your players as something is kind of a, uh, a nice little benefit for everybody else because they get to have a better time. That's just a dick move. Uh, so my complaints are pretty easy to fix. So with a few changes like that, a keeper who puts the work in and uh, drops in all the little details that they need to, Secret of Castor Negro is a solid adventure and it's definitely worth a look. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews and how-tos, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, I really like the idea that some of the degenerates escaped and they go all the hills have eyes. And then you could do a modern day sequel scenario where the investigators have to face them. What do you think? Yeah, I like it.